Good afternoon and welcome to another Waukegan History Museum History Lunch and Learn. My name is Ty Rohr. I'm the Manager of Cultural Arts for the Waukegan Park District and I also work on behalf of the Waukegan Historical Society. Today, May 8, 2020, marks the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II in Europe also known as Victory in Europe or VE Day. And today, I will share just a few of the many connections that Waukegan has with World War II. First though, I want to recognize two of our research library crew members, Anne Darrow and Beverly Millard. So much of this information comes from genealogical research that Anne and Bev have done over the years. Sometimes the research was for some of our cemetery walks or for other projects or exhibits, but often this research was done by Anne and Bev just because it needed to be done. And they wanted to fill in some of the missing gaps in various stories. Anne and Bev, thank you again I hope that we'll all be back together in the research library soon. And also, it's amazing how organized Anne and Bev are. Uh, I'm able to squeak over real quick to our research library, grab the files that I need. Everything is there, uh, collected by Anne, Bev, and other uh, volunteers at our research library for, well, for over 50 years. So, makes my job easy. All, this, all the things have been found already. I just need to com compile them to share in the stories with you all. I get to do the fun part. So we start today, of course, with the attack on Pearl Harbor. On Sunday, December 7th, 1941, at 7.48 a.m., the attack commenced. The Second World War had already begun, but without the United States military involvement up to that point. And Waukegan did have some sailors at Pearl Harbor on that infamous day. John H. Lindsley of Waukegan was aboard the USS Oklahoma that morning. Lindsley was one of the 429 crewmen to lose his life during the attack. Lindsley's remains were finally identified just a few years ago in 2016. And after this lunch and learn, I will post the C-SPAN video of Lindsley's military burial at Arlington um, and it'll be on the Waukegan History Museum Facebook page. And we did have other uh, Waukeganites there, um, or sometimes some of our stories come from folks that move into Waukegan after the war as well. Um, but I'm happy to share uh, their heroic stories. Um, unfortunately, not going to cover everybody today. Uh, Waukegan, like so many other communities, had uh, many people represent them in the war. Uh, but I've just chosen a few different uh, stories and people to highlight for today. Now, Waukegan's highest ranking officer was Admiral Richard Lansing Connolly. Connolly was born in Waukegan on April 26, 1892. He had served in World War I and was awarded the Navy Cross for saving the USS West Bridge after two German torpedoes had hit it. And after World War I, he served on different ships. In May of 1939, he was given command of Destroyer Division 7, then Destroyer Squadron 6. And his squadron was at sea during the attack on Pearl Harbor. But early 
after the United States entered into World War II, Connolly was instrumental in the Doolittle Raid on April 18, 1942. The Doolittle Raid was uh, the U.S. attacking Tokyo. It was the first strike on the Japanese home islands, and it was a retaliation for Pearl Harbor, and it showed Japan that the United States could bomb them. The raid ultimately caused very little damage, but it was an important boost to morale. The raid was planned and executed by Lieutenant Colonel James Doolittle, Connolly was in charge of a group of destroyers who escorted and protected the Hornet aircraft carrier for which the Air, uh, United States aircraft uh, lifted off from. Doolittle on uh, the attack said the Japanese people had been told they were invulnerable. An attack on the Japanese homeland would cause confusion in the minds of the Japanese people and so doubts about the reality, the reliability of their leaders. There was a second and equally important psychological reason for this attack. Americans badly needed a morale boost. Now in Later on, World War II, Connolly was part of other various attacks and invasions, and he was promoted to Rear Admiral in July of 1942. He had the nickname Close In Connolly because he wanted his ships as close to the beaches to be able to give the best support for invading troops. After World War II, Admiral Connolly was assigned president of the Naval War College in Newport, Rhode Island and he retired in November of 1953. Connolly and his wife died in airlines flight number one on March 1st, 1962, which crashed shortly after taking off from Idlewild Airport in New York City. And Connolly is buried at Arlington National Cemetery. Connolly was honored in 1978 with the USS Connolly destroyer ship being named or being commissioned in his name. When the USS Connolly was no longer in service, uh, there was a movement for a while uh, trying to get the uh, destroyer to the Waukegan Harbor as kind of a tourist uh, attraction. Fortunately, that never did pan out. Um, the USS Connolly was eventually sunk uh, to create an artificial reef. And then the home front, Waukegan during the war. Here we see the Hotel Waukegan um, at the corner of Washington Street and Sheridan Road. Uh, in the very bottom right corner, you can just barely see the Waukegan Carnegie Library there as well. So President Roosevelt established the Office of Civilian Defense in May of 1941, and it was responsible for planning community health programs and medical care of civilians in the event of a military attack on the United States. And Waukegan was the first to establish a council in the Chicagoland region, establishing it six days after the president's announcement. And Waukegan's council had uh, created things, uh, bulletins, organizational aids, templates and guides, and other Midwest councils used uh, what Waukegan had created um, as they were establishing their own, uh, as their own councils. Now, of course, right now we all have our own uh, stay at home orders or instructions uh, that we are having to follow. Um, here, though, we can see the blackout instructions for the city of Waukegan issued on January 8, 1942. Uh, so, blackouts um, were an effort to uh, cut down on the amount of 
light that cities produced. So in the case of uh, an attack, uh, it would be harder for uh, enemy airplanes to bomb the cities because they'd be blacked out. Um, we, I'll pull, talk about a few of these here that I find interesting. Um, if you're at home in a hotel room or an apartment, um, number seven, if you have any dogs, be sure to keep them indoors. Experience has proved that they are a hazard under blackout conditions. Uh, number 10 there, don't pull the main switch. I like that one, always a good idea. Uh, if you are outdoors, uh, keep to the right, do not run and walk, use extreme caution in crossing a street, uh, no smoking, that's number six, no smoking in the open is a rule during a blackout, do not light any matches or permit fires to burn out of doors. Do not park in front of a fire exit, hospital entrance, things like that. And number 10, kind of similar to what we're doing right now, do not congregate in groups of five or more persons on any public sidewalk, street, alley, or place. And blackouts are not planned. They may come at any time, so be prepared. Now at the start of the war, Lake County had a population of around 120,000 people. Uh, 34,000 of which lived in Waukegan. The local industries, though, in Waukegan and Lake County, they did receive big defense contracts, so they went into wartime production, and the Waukegan plans for working 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, and 21 Lake County industries were devoting 100% of their time to war production. During the war, more than 60,000 new residents came to Lake County to work in the defense plants and construction. The movement called a mighty boom by the new sun in 1942, and in Waukegan alone, 6,000 people moved in during the war. So here we see American Steel and Wire went into wartime production, of course, and not only are people moving in uh, to work at these industries, but also some of the workforce, they are joining the war efforts or being drafted. Uh, one person that I'll mention is William Gardner. He was born in Waukegan, moved with his family to North Chicago at the age of two. Uh, later on in his life, he started to work at American Steel and Wire. He married his wife, Evelyn, in 1940, and they had two children, Barbara Jean and Sandra Lee. William enlisted in the Army January 29, 1944. He was sent to Camp Blanding, Florida for training. William served in Company B, the 210th Battalion Heavy Weapons of the 38th Infantry. He went overseas with his unit in spring of 1944 and was quartered in England until the beginning of uh, the invasion, uh, so right before Normandy. He sent a letter home on August 6th that his unit was preparing to go to war. William was killed in battle eight days later on August 14th in France. His wife was notified of his death on October 4th. His remains were later returned home. Another example that I have of how these industries were impacted was the United States Envelope Company. Uh, during World War II, that factory had 425 men and women uh, do various things for the war. And of, of those, 18 uh, did die. So these industries were ramped up, working 24-7, 
um, bringing in thousands of people to the area to work, but also uh, feeling the pain of losing uh, the, some of their workers to the war. Um, here I'll read a little bit from the memories, wartime memories of uh, Elaine Egan. Elaine and her husband Paul, uh, longtime supporters of uh, the Historical Society, uh, lifetime members. Um, from Elaine, she said, I started high school in September, but on December 7th, 1941, the world came crashing down. Japan had attacked Pearl Harbor. My uncle, Martin Hubner, one of my mother's twin brothers, was in the Navy. He was in a ship which was bombed by the Japanese and was one of the few survivors of the attack. We were at war. The Navy took over all the land on the south side of 24th Street there in North Chicago, so there was no more going and having lunch on the big rock in the woods. A fence went up and Navy guards marched up and down inside the fence day and night. Barracks were built in no time flat. I could hardly believe what was happening. A small factory, Bartlett Engineering, opened up in North Chicago. My mother got a job there. My mother had never worn blue jeans, but she wore them to work. I just couldn't get over that, as we were not even allowed to wear jeans or leggings in high school. After the war, we learned that Bartlett Engineering made components for the atomic bomb. My mother had never been told what the components she had been working on were for. My dad got a job at Johns Manville in Waukegan and worked 12 hours a night, so he had to sleep during the day, and nobody had better wake him up. My dad's best friend, Fred Nelson, and his wife, Hazel, had but one son, Sonny, who was in the Army. They lived in Chicago and would come out and visit us now and then. Sonny was killed in the war. Life was never the same for his parents again. Few other things here. The bottom right of this picture, we see a picture of Mrs. Clarence Adams, who was uh, chairman of the Waukegan War Nursery. Uh, so she's there with a few children of the nursery. Uh, so the Waukegan War Nursery was established so that families would have uh, a place for their children. Um, because many of the mothers had gone into work at the industries or uh, they needed someone to care for their children, uh, so these nurseries were established. Children themselves locally helped uh, in the war efforts. Uh, one little story that I found, um, the supply of Capic, I hope I'm saying that right, a cotton-like fiber from a tropical tree which was used to fill life jackets. Well, um, the supply was cut off. Uh, so something else was needed to fill the life jackets. Um, and the Boy Scouts of Waukegan, well, they decided to help in the efforts and they gathered 2,480 pounds of milkweed pods to use as a substitute fill for life jackets. Here we see the old cannon that used to stand on the grounds of the Lake County Soldiers and Sailors Monument um, outside of the Lake County Courthouse. Well, being removed uh, to be, well, they needed the metal. Uh, the story is three cannon and one mortar, which have stood on guard around the Soldiers and Sailors Monument on the Courthouse Square for nearly 50 years were removed yesterday to become a part of another war. Having first seen service in the Civil War, they will be converted into scrap and used for armament in this war. The cannon, cannonballs, and cast iron fence around the monument yielded about six tons of metal. Of course, the Lake County Sailors and Soldiers Monument is still standing proudly on the grounds of the Lake County Courthouse but no cannons next to it.
So those are just a few different things happening within the within the home front in Waukegan. Of course, there were blood drives, uh, many people gathering to uh, roll bandages, collecting supplies, sending things out to the soldiers. Uh, but now I'm going to talk about a few different uh, folks involved in the war, a little bit about what they were doing. And first, uh, a few of our uh, women soldiers or women warriors. Uh, I've pulled out two to talk about today. The first being Mary M. Booker. She was the first WAAC uh, from Waukegan. Uh, the WAAC was the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps. Uh, they were established for the purpose of making available to the national defense the knowledge, skill, and special training of the women of the nation. Uh, so Miriam Booker was the first in Waukegan to join that. Um, she became a group leader with 12 students or 12 te teachers under her supervision. And before enlisting listing in the Army Auxiliary Group, she was a librarian at the Waukegan Township High School. Next is Janice Christensen, and if you've been following some of these History Lunch and Learns, uh, the Influential Women of Waukegan uh, Lunch and Learn, I did feature uh, Janice Christensen in that as well. Uh, but she was one of the very few women to join as a WASP in the Women Air Force Service Pilots. Um, one of only 1,800 civilian uh, volunteer women and Janice like the others flew almost every type of military aircraft as part of the experimental program that lasted for two years so flying the aircraft uh, around the country <clears throat> next we have combat photographer Albert Klein Albert Klein learned the photographer's trade from his father, Herman, who owned North Shore Studios at 4 North Genesee Street in downtown Waukegan. Klein graduated from Waukegan High School in 1938 and married Martha Litchfield in 1941. Two months after the birth of their first child, Albert left for overseas duty in World War II. Klein was commissioned as a lieutenant and because of his photography knowledge was assigned as a combat photographer in the U.S. Army Signal Corps under the command of Colonel Daryl Zanuck. Zanuck, founder of the movie studio 20th Century Fox, was documenting through film the combat in North Africa. As a combat photographer with Colonel Zanuck, Klein was often in the thick of combat. Cameramen were armed as infantrymen and were ready to fight as combat troops in an emergency, but their main objective was collecting the action on film. On one such occasion during, the land, during a landing strike, Colonel Zanuck reported that Klein took out a German machine gun nest with a grenade in one hand and a camera in the other. And Klein was considered to be one of the best cameramen. Klein and other photographers generally used 16 millimeter cameras with Kodachrome film magazine clips. They were light to carry and simple to reload in a hurry. Lieutenant Klein witnessed the surrender of Major General Fritz, Fritz Kross, Kraus, I'm sorry, German artillery commander of, of Hitler's Africa Corps in Tunisia. Klein captured the moment with his camera and rode in the Jeep with the dejected Nazi commander to the American headquarters. Upon hearing the news that her husband was part of this momentous event, Martha stated, this is wonderful. I'm so glad that my husband could be there at such a historic moment. Now, Jack Benny isn't the only one from Waukegan who is famous. So here we're looking at that picture from that famous historic event. Uh, Klein titled it The Beginning of the End, Africa, 1943. Klein remained a commercial photographer 
um, and continued this when he returned back after the war in Waukegan. Um, and he was also uh, become certified by the Northern Illinois Professional Photographers Association. Here we have uh, Frank Gonzalez, who is not a combat photographer. So let me just fix that right there. Um, this is a story that I was not familiar with until going through our uh, archives here this week, uh, putting together a little more of this presentation. Turns out Frank Gonzalez, World War II veteran, was one was among one of the 500,000 Latino or Hispanics who served in the war. So Frank Gonzalez was originally born in Texas to Mexican parents. Um, but then his parents finally settled in Waukegan when uh, Frank was 12. He was the oldest of 15 children, including two brothers who also served in World War II. Gonzalez was drafted in 1942 at the age of 22. At the time, he had a wife and daughter. Um, he was inducted into the Army at Camp Grant, formerly located outside of Rockford. He then received training in Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and he thought he was going to be sent east to the European Front or west to the Pacific, but instead was deployed south to Panama in 1943 for 18 months. And Frank Gonzalez said, we were jungle fighters in case they wanted to send us to Okinawa. Gonzalez said, and we were trained to withstand heat and the vegetation equivalent to fighting overseas. Uh, he never did experience combat, um, but in the Pacific um, was sent to various uh, different places, various different posts. Uh, but neat that Waukegan has representative of one of the few uh, Hispanics who served in World War II. And this is a story that uh, we're going to flesh out and talk a little bit more here at some point. Um, there's quite a, a family legacy here, it looks like, uh, not just with Frank and World War II, but some other family member stories as well. Up next, we have the Fighting Olsen family. The father, Yalmer, was born in Norway, came to the United States in 1880, and entered into the Navy. He had his second stint with the Navy when he and his family moved to Waukegan after Great Lakes Naval Base was opened. His third and final time on active duty was during World War I. He and his wife, Anna, had seven children, all of whom were involved in the U.S. Navy in some capacity. Daughter Anna married a man who eventually retired as a captain. Son Lawrence died in a fire at Annapolis Preparatory School. Son Earl was a lieutenant commander when he was killed in the Solomon Islands in World War II in November of 1942. The four remaining sons, Charles, Clarence, Robert, and Albert, all graduated from the U.S. Naval Academy at Annapolis. They had naval careers and retired with the rank of captain or admiral. But for the son, Earl, who died during World War II, uh, a destroyer, the USS Earl K. Olson, was christened by Mother Anna in 1944. So Waukegan actually has a few different uh, naval ships uh, named after some of their residents, uh, with the USS Earl K. Olson being being one of those but quite a quite a family legacy there with the navy here a picture of the normandy invasion or d-day june 6 1944 and bob lundy was there 
Lundy decided that he wanted to be a paratrooper, basically because they got an extra $50 a month. And he eventually found himself jumping behind enemy lines uh, in Europe uh, during World War II. He says of the uh, D-Day invasion, the thing was we were supposed to go a day early, but the Army Air Corps wouldn't fly because the weather was so bad. They had to pull those gliders and they were basically made of balsa wood. When it was time to load up, Lundy said, I remember the guy behind you had to push you in because we had so much equipment on. Our job was to land and go back to the beach and clear the way for the landings. And they scattered us all over France. As it turned out, D-Day was a safe one for Bob Lundy, but bad luck caught up to the 20-year-old on D-Day plus three when a grenade went off behind him. He said, a grenade fragment hit my left arm and I was knocked out. A piece went through my steel helmet and lodged between the steel and this kind of plastic liner they had, and I was out cold. After recovery, uh, Lundy would return to the front in time for the German counteroffensive in December of 1944. Uh, there his health took another hit, this time uh, from the elements. He, he got pneumonia in Belgium during the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, he was able to come out of this okay as well, and by the war's end, he returned back home and said that he had never returned back to Europe um, until uh, back in 2009 um, because he got married, raised a family, and just did not have time. But Bob Lundy at, uh, at D-Day. I will also post uh, another uh, video to our Facebook page after I'm done here. Fortunately, not all of uh, our Waukegan uh, soldiers were as lucky as Bob Lundy at Normandy. Uh, Robert Follinsby, uh, he died in the invasion. And uh, Andrea Flores, uh, who was a student at Waukegan High School at the time, uh, was able to take a trip over to France with uh, Josh Bill, uh, president of the Historical Society, but also a uh, teacher there at Waukegan uh, High School. And uh, the video that I'll be posting is the eulogy that she did from uh, Follinsby's grave at the uh, Normandy American Cemetery in France. Henry Kolb, I've always been uh, fascinated with the, uh, the B-24 bombers, well, any of those bombers, but especially the ball turret gunners, uh, those, those brave uh, men sitting there underneath the airplane. Uh, and Henry Kolb was one of those folks. He was a staff sergeant in the US Army 15th Air Force and as a ball turret gunner, um, he was a ball turret gunner on the B-24 Liberator airplane known as Sky Wolf. And there you can see the crew of the Sky Wolf in that picture. It's not the best picture, sorry, um, but you, you can see the crew there. Uh, Kolb was actually the oldest combat airman in the European War Theater, and he was uh, in his early 40s during the war. And he had an impressive record with 50 missions as the ball turret gunner. And the Sky Wolf with Kolb flew a total 280 mission hours and is credited with downing 36 planes. Sky Wolf had daylight raids over Germany, Italy, Romania, Yugoslavia, Czechoslovakia, France, Austria, Hungary, and, Hungary and Bulgaria. And Kolb said that we took part in what the Germans called the biggest air battle of the war. It was over Austria, and the going was pretty tough. Our right tail was shot off, and the ship came home with 183 bullet holes in her, but she is flying fine.
Richard Earl Bush is a recipient of the Medal of Honor. So he's one of two Waukegan recipients to receive the Medal of Honor, the other being Orion Howe, uh, the Civil War drummer boy. Uh, Richard Earl Bush was raised in Glasgow, Kentucky. He enlisted in the Marines during World War II at the age of 17. After training, he was assigned to South Pacific where he was wounded several times and received the Purple Heart. Received four in total, actually. On April 16, 1945, Bush, member of the suicide outfit known as the Marine Corps Raiders, uh, well, they were uh, they led most of the Marine landings in Pacific. And Bush was a part of the group charging Mount Ye on Okinawa Island, and he was wounded again. But while he was being treated by the medics, he saw a hand grenade which had been thrown into the area. He smothered it with his body, jumping on it, saving surrounding personnel. He lost an eye in this, plus other serious wounds. And he was awarded the Medal of Honor by President Truman on October 5th, 1945. And he moved to Waukegan after his military career. The Medal of Honor given for displaying courage and sacrifice above and beyond the call of duty. And Richard Earl Bush definitely showed his courage that day, April 16, 1945, jumping on the live grenade and saving uh, the personnel that was around it. And again, today, the 75th anniversary of VE Day, Victory in Europe Day. Here are uh, two Waukegan soldiers, and I'll read what they were doing on VE Day. Paul Egan, if you remember the uh, memoir that I read early on from Elaine, his wife. Uh, Paul Egan was a tech sergeant. Egan was a, a machine gun, gun squad leader in the 69th Infantry Division. Um, he was uh, north of Leipzig um, on the E Day. Victor Sneller, a uh, sergeant, he was a gunner with the 774th Tank Destroyers. He was somewhere in Czechoslovakia on the E Day. And here we're looking at uh, the destruction, the ruins at Nagasaki in Japan after uh, the atomic bomb had dropped there. Henry Jeffers of Waukegan was at Nagasaki a few days after the, the bomb. And Jeffers got a long firsthand look at the devastation uh, that took place. And he said, we were the first U.S. ship into Nagasaki Harbor. He said the scene was eerie. There were no living Japanese. They had fled into the hills and hadn't returned yet. The smell of death was still strong. The bomb's resultant firestorm had been strangely inconsistent. All the buildings in an area would have been completely flattened, yet one in the middle would have been left standing. So Jeffers seeing uh, the destruction at Nagasaki at the tail end of the war. And then Victory Day over Japan, the end of World War II was August 14th, 1945. Here we see folks gathered in downtown Waukegan. They are on the, the uh, northeast corner of Genesee Street and Washington Street in front of the old United Cigar Store. Now, Waukegan had a total of 135 uh, 
men that were killed in action nor missing in action from uh, the Europe and Pacific theaters in World War II. So there we have a few of our stories, just a very few. Um, there's so many uh, stories to share with World War II. I just wanted to get kind of a sampling of different points in the war for you today. Uh, talk about just a few of the, the uh, heroic uh, men and women uh, from Waukegan that participated in that. Um, on behalf of the Waukegan Park District and the Waukegan Historical Society, thank you for joining me today in commemorating the 70, 75th anniversary of VE Day. I will be on again next week, uh, Friday at noon, with another History Lunch and Learn. The topic will be famous visitors to Waukegan. So I figured we're all thinking about right now places we would like to visit, so I will share those people that visited here. Um, everyone, please have a great weekend and a happy Mother's Day to all of those moms out there. Hi, Mom. Happy Mother's Day. And I look forward to talking about the past again with you in the future. Thanks again for joining on this uh, historic day, 75th anniversary of Victory in Europe Day. This is Ty Rohr signing off.